He is a four-time Forest Wood Cup qualifier, a four-time Bassmaster Classic qualifier, a member of the Bassmaster Century Club, and even a former junior world champion. This week, the baby shark, Shane LeHue, joins me on... I'm Bob Cobb for the Bassmaster. Welcome to Mercer. Welcome one, welcome all, friends, family, freeloaders, fishing freaks. Here we go again with the Awkwardly Honest Fishing Podcast that goes by my last name, which is Mercer. Happy hump day to all of you. You are halfway through the week. i got to thank, as I always do, all our humpers that tune in week after week, and I truly appreciate every single one of you. Something that came up in the comments last week and got me thinking is, started noticing people posting things like, hey, I listened to this on my way to work, or I got a ridiculous commute, thanks for making it a little shorter, or I listened to this on my way to fishing, I listened to this during fishing, so it got me thinking, I want to know when you listen to this. Where and when do you listen to this? What are you doing when you listen to this? Um, let's have some fun in the comments. Let me know what you're up to when you're listening to the weekly tomfoolery that is the Mercer podcast. Um, so that's it. That's the question of the week. And, um, the guest of the week is a good one. Um, he is, a a dude who just, you know, quietly confident, quietly does very, very well in the elite series. Um, but he's not that outwardly open weirdo like me, pretty quiet guy. A lot of times. So, um, that's why I'm kind of excited to get inside his head and learn a little more about the baby shark, Shane LeHue. Come on, let's learn about sharks together. Was that, yeah, that was cheesy, wasn't it? Yeah, well, who cares? <laughs> I am the king of formage from North Carolina, the baby shark, Shane LeHue. Shane LeHue, how are you? I'm doing good, Dave. How about you? I'm good. I'm good. It's, it's, um, it's like 80 degrees. Uh, that's Canada, what Chris, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's it's like summer. Chris Johnson is actually on the way to my house, but yeah, he called me this morning. It's like it's like seventy five here. It's only like yeah. it was only like sixty here this morning, which is kind of it's been like eighty every day. So, well, and, I know. should be fishing, but but instead yeah. I'm doing <laughs> podcasts. Yeah. I held you up. <laughs> well, no, but we're early. I, I'm literally because we're a few hours early. I mean, this doesn't mean anything to our viewers because, I mean, it airs Wednesday at 6 o'clock, so you don't need to know when we're recording this. But because you're a couple hours earlier, I'm totally going get, to get up to get to go fishing right after this. So I do appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was just clearing your schedule for you. You're a good man. You're a good man. You got to be happy with your start to the season, though. Yeah. Yeah, I've had a pretty good first two tournaments. I mean, it's, you know, nice to get the ball rolling like that. Usually, uh, to be honest, I suck in Florida. Uh, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. I think I've had a good event ever in my career at Okeechobee. It was the very first event I ever fished professionally. And then uh, after that, I've sucked. So I did good at the St. John's that one year, but that was kind of it. Why Why is Florida that to so many anglers? Man, I don't know. It's just it's something I don't get to do a ton. So it's just not really in my wheelhouse, I guess you would say, unless they're on – Unless they're spawning. Like, if it's a full-blown spawn tournament, then I'm fine. Um, but if they're not, I just don't do well with fishing in crowds, number one. <laughs> I hate it. I just dislike it uh, very strongly. So I tend to try to stray away, and that always uh, kind of bites me in the ass, to be honest with you. Man. In Florida, you know how that is. It's a grass, like, all the time, and you wind up seeing a lot of guys. But usually the guy that wins does find something a little on his own. So. Yeah, I just never found it. Why do you hate fishing in the crowd? That does it distract you, or like, what? Well, well, or you just yeah. feel your odds are better away from everybody? Yeah, I'd just rather get away from everybody. I mean, I don't like seeing people catch six pounders right next to me. And you know, if you're if you're the guy catching them, man, it's great. You're like everybody else. You know, you're in their head. Like you've you've done it. <laughs> you you scrambled a lot of brains in the area, and then it, if you're not. You're the guy that's like, I got to get out of here. I got to quit watching this. <laughs> it's bad. And then yeah. this year, there was only a couple guys 
in the area that I fished at Okeechobee. So that was nice. It was me, Cobb, and Swindle, and that was it. So nice. It was kind of have that. Because at Okeechobee, I mean, it's gotten really small, obviously, um, with everything that's going on with that lake over the past few years with hurricanes and whatever it may be. But yeah, it was nice of, just have one. One of the biggest lakes we go to, and <laughs> – it's at the same time, as fish is tiny. <laughs> yeah, it's like fishing four different farm ponds. Is what it well, is. well, you were in the right. Well, you were in one of the right ones, anyway. One of the right ones. Yeah. So tell. I mean, I mean, for those who don't know, I I think I have to. I mean, if you've ever watched away, and we've talked about it a lot, but how he became the baby shark was just literally by not answering an email. Um, yeah. Our old DJ Shannon, he. uh I guess he said, if you don't answer this email, you're going to get baby shark. Well, you got baby shark. Yep. You kind of are a baby shark, though, dude. You're a little guy, but you're you're kind of, you know, a scary creature, a predator on the Elite Series. <laughs> are you four or five years into this baby shark thing, or are you happy it's a thing, or are you ready for the shark to go away? No, I think it's stuck. I tried to change it that one time, and I got so much crap for it. I mean, it was like... After the weigh in, I remember where it was. I think it was a classic. And I think I switched it. And dude, I got like 50 text messages. Like, if you don't change that back, I'm <laughs> going to be pissed. My kids hate you right now. I'm like, okay, we got to change it back. So I texted, I was like, change it tonight if you can. Like, let's go back to Baby Shark. But yeah, my grandma was actually over earlier and she was talking about that. And uh, she loves the story because she knows how I am. I'm the world's worst procrastinator like i will get it done but it, i will get it done if you give me a deadline it's gonna be 10 minutes before that deadline and i'm I the just, same yeah i'm terrible like I'm, I'm awful about it my wife will attest to that too it's it's pretty bad but yeah obviously i'm not very big on emails either i'd rather you just call me or text me you know what i mean like i'm gonna look at my phone more for that than i am emails Sometimes I'll look and I have like 400 emails. So I'm like, man, I probably should go through these now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he sent me. And, and the, it, it surprised me. I thought it was one of my buddies. I thought it was a joke. Like he somehow he got in touch with one of my friends and was like, hey, is this funny? Let's do this. And it was just all on his own. So everybody thought it was funny at first. And then it just kind of stuck. So yeah. I, don't think away from it. <laughs> I think we're still, I think we're here. Yeah, so I mean, I, I with some remixes or something like so we can switch it up a little bit because it does get, you know, somewhat repetitive. Yeah, well, let's throw it out there in the comments. Send us some remixes of <laughs> yes, Baby, Shark, Baby and, Shark remixes. And you could be um, you could you could be part of the Elite Series and Shane LaHue's introduction every week. And I think it's less offensive now, like. Just because you don't hear it near as much, like when you were here, like when it was ridiculous, it, you would oh, like yeah. there was times where people would just be like, oh. You'd hear parents. You'd be it without even seeing their kids. You're like, that's a parent in the crowd that is tired of hearing that song. Uh, oh, yeah. But um, it is nice for the kids and stuff like that. Like my yeah. niece, she loves it. Like they watch the weigh-ins and she I, she dances every time it comes on. So <laughs> it's kind of stuck. That's awesome. That's all. And your grandma likes it, right? So I mean, it, yeah. Is this, well, is this Chief's grandma? This is Chief's grandma. She oh, just thinks I love funny. her. Like, because she knows, like I said, who I am. Like, once I told her the story, she was like, "Yep, that's you to a T." <laughs> Not the whole you're supposed to on time. <laughs> have you have you always been that way? Like a last minute dude, all through school oh, and yeah. everything. Yeah, school was. Yeah, most of the time, school was you know trying to sneak out and go fishing. Honestly, <laughs> like I I was really good in school for like the first three years, and then you know senior year, if you're like, where I mean my school you'd have like four classes a day. So you were out by like whatever it was, 1.30. Well, luckily my chemistry teacher, it was a biochemistry. I was like, I'm not going to use this. I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to be a fisherman. And he was like, man, if you, you know, miss some classes, you're good. So I believe at like 12 every day. And there was a cop actually that worked at the school that would write people up. Well, he fished too. He'd always see me leaving and just wave. <laughs> I had a little thing going. <laughs> yeah cj was like man you just take me fishing a couple times i'll let you i'll let you ride out just don't tell anybody <laughs> so you had the system set that's oh yeah yeah it was pretty base is covered yeah so I'd how... go, go ahead i'd go from 7 30 to 12 and then go fish for you know four or five hours 
It works for me. I mean, that's basically what I'm going to do here today. <laughs> yeah. some, some things don't change. Huh. So when did when did you do when did you decide that in your head? Like, what age were you when you said, "Man, this is what I'm going to do"? I mean, I I knew how hard it was to do it. Honestly, um, I started traveling with college fishing and stuff like that. And our school was it was UNC Charlotte, and they didn't really pay for anything. So I didn't know how I was going to make it, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, and my dad, he got me into fishing. I've, I've been going since I was, I could cast like five years old. I started fishing tournaments with him when I was like eight. Like, so wow. I was just addicted to it. I mean, I really wanted to play golf, but half the time I sucked at golf. So <laughs> golf didn't work. Golf didn't work, so now you're fishing. I mean, yeah. that's not, it's not bad. I'm still golfing, but just, you know, poorly, 50% of the time. Why is it like that about golf? Because I've, I'd, I'm have i part of golf in my entire life, but I'm actually pretty decent at it for somebody who doesn't golf at all. And there's been a few times in my life where I've gotten into it, and I'm like, people are like, man, if you spend some time. Yeah. But it's almost like the more time you spend with it, the shittier you get yeah, it's like a, it's a horrible same. sport oh, i'm the exact same way i think we played three evenings this week and i'm progressively getting worse like <laughs> the first time the first day we went i mean i was killing the ball i couldn't miss it was nice and then we went again i got a little worse then we went last night and i got even worse i was like the more i play the more i suck. if i don't play for like two months i'm better but if i do if i because you start thinking you're like how can i get better yeah and then, that's when you you just don't do it enough and you're not going to make changes on your own and let, there's people that are just naturally good at it obviously just like any sport yeah but people like me that start thinking oh man i watched this youtube video i'm about <laughs> to do this with the ball like no you're not <laughs> you're not tiger woods get back in your lane uh and if you've ever i mean i've golfed with a few pro golfers not tiger woods but pro golfers yeah dude, what they can do with a ball Oh, it's incredible. Like it's yeah. you, you tell them like put it right there. It's right freaking like it's amazing. Yeah. But I feel the same way about you guys on the Elite Series. I, that's one thing that bothers me. I think in the sport of fishing for whatever messed up reason, if it is a sport, but in the activity of fishing, you guys don't get enough credit. There's a lot of people who sit back and are like, and I know it's hard for you to say that, but I mean, there are people sit back and be like, well, if I had that sponsorship or I got that opportunity or my dad took me when I was eight. No, it's not that simple. Like, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people who had all those opportunities and they're not, they might be tournament MCs now. Who knows? <laughs> yeah. it's, I mean, fishing is just a big risk. It's a gamble, right? I mean, we're gamblers. That's what we are. We Did has that always been like, does the gambling get to you or you, or do you, there's some people that feel like when, the weight gets on their shoulders, they crumble. But there's some people like the more weight that gets on their shoulders, yeah, the harder they climb. Where, where are you on that? Um, you know how I am. I'm even keeled. I don't <laughs> hardly show emotion. Like that's what everybody's like at fork when I was catching big ones and stuff. They're like, man, you just like are the same. Like you catch a pound and a half or an eight pounder, it's nothing different. Like you know, it's just the way I've always been. I try to keep it, keep it even. Like. I don't get overly excited. I don't, I used to get really pissed off. I mean, I do hold myself to a very high standard. Uh, I'm very hard on myself to, you know, sometimes too much. Um, a little we mean to do well. Yeah. 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 Cause I mean, I, I think I know what I'm capable of just mm -hmm. like everybody else. And if I feel like if you're not like that, then what are you doing? Like, why are you there? <laughs> you know, I agree. I yeah, agree. If you don't have that mindset of I'm gonna go and do well every time. Then, and you're obviously not. It's fishing. Like you're gonna make some bad decisions. Fish are gonna leave. They swim all the time. <laughs> I mean, things happen. Like it's just. But you in those tournaments, I, I've gotten better about not getting so frustrated about it. I think that's helped me um, the last couple of years. Yeah, that, I mean that's a proven trait. You know, if yeah. you're, if you, if we had weird science, we were designed a future pro that's going to win everything that even killed, I mean, all of the greats, like you look at all the hall of famers and 
I just had him on the podcast and I've said this to his face, the only spaz in the bunch, honestly, like when you look at all the hall of famers, like the only person that is not very even killed. Yeah. Is Ike and Ellie. Really, yeah. when you think about it, and and I think that it's a relative term because that's even killed for Ike and Ellie. You know what I mean? That aggression he needs, that's part of what he needs to feed off. And then there's people like yourself that are yeah. mellow. You ever get like super pissed off? <laughs> That's, I mean, it works for him. That would not work for me. I would be spun out in about five minutes. We'd be done with for the day. But yeah, when's I mean, the last I, time you got real mad? Oh man, I don't know. Um, I did get pretty pissed off at Wisconsin last year. That was a terrible tournament. Actually, Wahi, Wisconsin, and I got in my head and it made it worse. And I usually don't do that. And it was just those two events because I was on the cusp of not making the classic like I was just I was in, in my own head but I, I literally have gotten a lot but when I was first it started in my career it was it'd take me four or five days to get over a tournament now it's like I mean I suck the classic this year but it's it's like when you take a bunch of chances and you go for and I, it just didn't work out so I don't I mean literally I was working at the expo the next day and never even thought about fishing like I was just watching it just to watch it you know, walking around the expo and watching Gussie smash small mouth. <laughs> well, he, he wasn't really smashing. No, not, not that day, but he did enough. He did enough. He did. Um, that must have been treacherous. Like, I, and I've asked him and he's kind of told me like he thought he had lost and whatever, but, but you oh, just okay. think of like that between like, just that's torture. Like you all day you're just, and he said it, he didn't go 10 minutes where he wasn't, fishing like didn't have a fish mark where he was working it so but just like what a way to win i don't know whether <laughs> like like know. that is one of the most evil ways to win like they, they, mentally that must just twist your brain oh yeah especially riding back an hour and 10 minutes or whatever he had like that's a long, <laughs> long boat ride buddy i'm sure he was just the his brain was out of control i mean yeah. I any of us would have been yeah like, you're probably thinking you just lost a classic like that would that would suck. But then when you get in, then you hear what everybody's got, and you think, "I really might win still." Yeah, that For that one. That's the coolest part of our sport, though. I think like that's the thing that needs to be protected so much. Like where that moment, and everybody tries to leak it, whether it be media, whether it be Bass Track, whether it be whatever. But that moment of surprise, that it, it's the one thing that, like, I mean, the Masters is freaking an incredible golf tournament to watch i watch it as often every year i'm pissed when we have a tournament on top of it i don't <laughs> yeah. watch any other golf tournaments but i'm obsessed by the masters but their you know award presentation sucks it's in a clubhouse right. but that's your moment to sink the pot and get that opportunity to go in and see the fans and everything so it's i hope we can protect that because i think it's a challenge you know the more live there is the more i mean how many people do you guys communicate with between the boat ramp and when you actually go into the arena right yeah it's i mean that's i agree it needs to be protected it's a big party you know especially the classic like that's massive there's so many people there and especially i know bass track you know you can kind of see what everybody's got but you know just as well as i do we got a bunch of sandbaggers yeah everybody myself included um you know Nobody, nobody. A self-admitted sandbagger. I like it. No, I mean, not, not really self-admitted, but I'm saying that I, I always want to, I've always wanted to be a little low because yeah. if, I feel like if you're high on your weight and then you weigh in, it's everybody's like, there's going to, I mean, so many guys are going to give me so much crap about it. Like, I don't yeah. want to be that high. I agree. I agree with that. I think it mentally it's better for you anyways. Like it, yeah. it, I was always low when I was guessing fishing terms just because, well, I was generally always low, but I was guess yeah. low because if you say to yourself, man, I think I got 20 and you only weigh an 18 and a half, you're pissed with 18 and a half. But if you say I'm, I'm 17 pounds, then you get yeah. 18 and a half. You're like, damn, I'm doing yeah. good. I mean, it's a emotional uptick. Yeah. Um, you still in the fishing business? Are you still you still have a fishing store? Uh, no, my dad sold the tackle store um, to a guy we know. He's a local guy, so the tackle store is still there. Uh, it's just owned by somebody different. We still have the Shane's baits, but you know he he does all that. Just 
because I'm gone so much. Like, I don't really have time to. But we, I, when I'm gone for two, three weeks, I can't keep up with all the orders and everything like that. So grandma helps with it. Wow. The whole <laughs> family's involved. <laughs> That's so pretty much a, a generational sweatshop you're running. You just <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he gets a bunch of high school kids to, <laughs> to help with the rigs and stuff. We got some buddies that help. Like, <laughs> Why am I seeing a scene from Happy Gilmore? <laughs> My fingers are sore. Yeah. I'd like a glass of shut the hell up, grandma. No, no, you're grandma. That was from a movie line. <laughs> uh, how different is this job that when you were a little kid saying, man, I'd love to be able to do this. How, how different is professional fishing now that you've done it for as long as you've done it than what you had envisioned? It was hectic at first. Um, obviously, it's a lot of time away from home. Everybody knows that. But it is nice, like, you know, usually in our, our off, our downtime, I guess you could call it. I mean, I get to be home with the wife, play a lot of golf. You know, even in between tournaments, like, I get to do a lot of things. So it is nice. I mean, it's a, it's a job, obviously. But it's the best job. Like, I get to go travel around the world and catch bass. I mean, that doesn't suck. So I get to fish when I'm home with buddies. I fish, I mean, I fish all the time. I fish year round. Norman, it's got uh, two hot water discharges on it. So we don't get any ice like you guys get. I fish, I can fish 12 months out of the year. It's nice. I live in a perfect area. I got 15 lakes around me that are, can be good at times. They can suck at times, honestly. Um, but it's nice. But it is, I mean, it does. The traveling part is definitely the toughest. Also, yeah. the financials of it are, everybody knows that. I mean, it's not cheap. It's, you know, like I said, we're gamblers. That's what it is. Uh, it is. I mean, it's gambling, <laughs> and um, but but the gambles have paid off for you for the most part. Um, but I didn't even know. I, I guess I knew this. I think it was a thing I knew. But I, going into the classic, I was doing some research, and I came across it again. When were you a junior world champion? 2007. So how old were you? Mm, let's see. I was born in 88. So 18, I think. Wow. And what was that experience? Like, I mean, obviously that fueled your future, I would imagine, just a taste of it. Yeah, it was pretty pretty neat. Obviously, I fished FLW before I yeah. fished bass. Um, so you can say those letters. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> it was FLW. Uh, and it was a FLW junior tournament. You know, you had to qualify through whatever the state or something like that. So you had to win the state tournament to get into that. Um, it was two different age groups. You fished with a younger kid. Well, I obviously was the older of the two. It was on uh, Lake Hamilton in Arkansas. Yeah, pretty, so. I've never been there, so it was pretty cool. Like, but uh, it was actually, we got to weigh in right before the Forcewood Cup guys weighed in uh, it was one scott suggs the one that the million played. dollar one million dollars yeah wow it was pretty cool we got to sit all in the front row and watch you know watch it all go down so, that's pretty cool it was that's a neat cool. experience at 18 years old like you weigh in, in front of all those people there's that you know you a lot of those people like at the classic they show up early to get seats mm -hmm. and stuff like that so there was a ton of people there you know 18 year old kid that it's pretty quiet <laughs> I still am pretty quiet, but not as quiet as I used to be. Is that is that tough in your line of work to be? You know what I mean? I've always just been a loud mouth. I'm born this way. Like, I mean, everything that my teachers told me would write on report cards <laughs> it was going to be down. My downfall is literally how I make a living. So for me, this is always how I've been. But when you look at how public a pro angler is now compared to, I mean, I think it was easier to be a quiet pro angler 15 years ago, but now there's, I mean, half the elite series is producing a TV show while they're competing. It right. just airs yeah. on YouTube. So do you, is that something you struggle with or, or does it, is it a difficulty for you? Yeah, it's tougher for me because I just like to go fish. Like I'm, I am old school for sure. Uh, so that that aspect of it, like whole social media and all that kind of stuff, yeah, that's obviously tough for me. Um, that's something I'm continually working at after 12 years. It's not 
not something I was just given with or, you know, ever like strive to do the YouTube stuff, but I'm, I'm going to start doing some of that stuff because that's the direction fishing is going, obviously, and that's no secret to anybody. Um, you know, you see a lot of kids and they ask, you know, well, how do you get sponsors and stuff like that? How do I get into that market? I'm like, well, you better be good at social media now. Like, that's what it is. You have to be just as good as everybody else, if not better. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wild. You've got one platform at Bass, but it, 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 and it's the same in the TV business. You know what I mean? Like I, for years, made a living from a TV show, which I still do and is great. And I'm thankful yeah. for it. But the exact same thing where sponsors are like, well, yeah, I know you got a TV show, but you also need to be on YouTube. You also need to be on all the, which. And I understand I, it. I think it's cool, you know, but it is, it is, it's, it's a big time commitment and it's got to be hard when you're, when you're competing. Like I, I it amazes me how guys like Paul Nick, it almost seems yeah. to ratchet them up. Like he performs better because he's got that, those eyeballs on him where, where even me as social as I am, dude, I feel like at events, I don't do enough social media wise. You know, I, I feel like I do a lot for bass and stuff like that. But as far as my own accounts, I'm just, just so busy. You just never yeah. seem to have a time to start walking around and talking to your camera. Um, but other people figure out a way to do it. Yeah. Paul Nick was the, he, like, he's one of the originators kind of, yeah. of that deal of being a professional and being so good at social media, like the videos and everything. He just, he's naturally good at it. You know, he's, and he, I think he really enjoys doing it. Like you said. Oh yeah. He, and he does. I mean, like I've shot with him several times and he's, he geeks out with the camera guys yeah. you know what i mean so oh what kind of camera is it like he loves all that stuff um how important is it in pro fishing to to live that lifestyle and and enjoy like have a positive attitude i mean it to me seems to stand out more and more every year like if, if you grumble the way through a season you're going to grumble your way out of the elite series yeah for sure i mean you gotta you know i always am more than willing to work for companies that I'm with like you know I, I, I try to make it more of a partnership than a business deal like I mean because we're both going to help each other out in the end so I, you got to stay positive and continue to work at all that stuff um, you know I think there's a line for me on how focused I have to be to fish a tournament and to do the social media part there's got to be you know, some give and take for me, just, just the way I am. Like I said, I'm even keeled. I'm not, you know, crazy or anything like that. I don't start screaming. Um, I'm just, I, I am who I am. And I think that's, it's been good for me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy with it. I'm happy with everything I have. Like I'm happy with how my career's gone. Yeah. I don't have any regrets. You can't have any regrets doing this, or you're just going to think back on the past all the time. And that's, not i mean you got to wake up tomorrow and get after it again you gotta focus on the next one yeah one thing you do focus on that amazes me that you're not that big into social media but you're a big pretty big gamer right i am yeah <laughs> i play a lot of video games <laughs> i go in spurts i'm not quite as invested as Cobb, but so i'm Cobb's pretty... more invested than you yeah yeah 100 percent See, when I talked to him, he made it sound like you were more of a video gamer than yeah, him at the time. He's yeah. lying. Yeah, he's lying. So he's who sure. is, who is, <laughs> there's a group of people, an angling group that are, are gamers. Who who are they? Uh, so Mullins plays now a lot. Which so is, weird. That blows my mind. Yeah, you just don't see David Mullins from the hills of Tennessee. Uh, Watch this Andy water. Griffith that <laughs> plays Call of Duty. <laughs> he gets on Call of Duty and just starts you know, shredding 12 year olds at Call of Duty. Uh, Mike Huff, he started playing a bunch. Tyler Rivette, actually. Wow, started, I didn't know yeah, that. Yeah, we, we sucked him into uh, Narnia with the video games. So he gets to lose a lot of his time as well. Most of the time <laughs> we play at night. So it's, you know, wife goes to bed, 10 o'clock, I'm all fired up, play Big. till. What time? You know, uh, sometimes a little too late sometimes two in the morning <laughs> what's your longest gaming session oh i don't even know probably six seven hours probably gosh 
just wasted time. <laughs> just excitement with the boys, you know? Well, that part I get. Like, they socialize. Okay. And, I mean, my son loves it. I get all. It's so weird how, like, video games were the most antisocial thing at one time. Like, when I was a kid growing up, it's like, put the games down, go out and do something. It's still kind of like that. But that's also how kids interact. You know what I mean? Like, a lot of... It, yeah, I mean, to a to a negative at times, oh, you know, yeah. who knows who you're talking to, but it uh, it's it's a weird, weird, weird world. Who's the best of all the oh, anglers? Cobb is. Yeah, yeah, Cobb is for sure. He's a peculiar dude, a gamer, he's, a whiskey connoisseur. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's very good at bowling. Come on. Yeah, he's good. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think he's like he's one of those weird guys that's like naturally good at a lot of odd things <laughs> he's really good at fishing obviously he's really good uh -huh. at bowling he's actually not bad at golf like he doesn't play golf ever and he'll pick up a club and swing it and hit it straight and i'm like yeah see i, I mean that just didn't happen for me <laughs> like when i was growing up i was getting lessons and all that stuff he's yeah he's an odd ball wow how did you two become roommates how did you have you always been buddies or no, you guys it, was, meet? it was again from uh, FLW. We uh, it was funny, and it's still to this day we'll not tell each other like where we're practicing or anything like that. So back when we started, we were fishing FLW. We started about the same time, and we would constantly run into each other in tournaments. Like it was weird. We'd show up in the same pocket on the lake. Like Sam Rayburn, I think, is actually where I asked him. I was finally like. Dude, do you got anybody to room with? He was like, well, he roomed with uh, Jamie Rampy, who's who used to fish. Um, he's very good on Harwell. A lot of people that probably watch this from around here will know who he is. And uh, he was like, yeah, just room with us. I was like, oh, it's just me and uh, Eric. So you had a co-angler back then, obviously. It was a guy I fished with in college. Yeah. He's like, well, y'all just stay with us, cut some costs. So ever since then, I think it was like 2015, probably. We've been staying together ever since gaming and so gaming season do you guys game on the road like when you're at an uh, event is there, no no that's serious time right yeah, no gaming then yeah. that's time to do do your job <laughs> there's no time you know how it is you get off the water at nine o'clock eat you're in bed you know the, especially like this time of year you can fish from seven to eight o'clock so i'm exhausted by the end of the week most of the time yeah and it only gets worse as you know we then we had north and it, yeah. you know the end of days but you know when we're on the saint lawrence river it's like 18 hours of daylight <laughs> yeah. i mean you, you can not go to sleep yeah i think takumi actually um pretty sure he told me that one of his first seasons he had to learn to do because he's like he said i'm dark to dark always and he said yeah. He had to, he, like, he got to the tournament. He was as exhausted, he said. Like, I never imagined. But, I mean, if you're dark to dark in the summer months up north, I mean, you're going to be fishing for a long, long day. So, the do the tournament days fly by for you? Do, the, uh, do they seem super sometimes. quick? Because generally, they're a lot shorter than the yeah, pre fish days. Like, especially when you're sucking and not catching anything. You look down, it's like 11.30. Like oh, shit, I better catch one. <laughs> I've got three hours to catch a bass. But I mean, those days obviously go by real fast. But yeah, I mean, they do seem a lot shorter because I mean they are, especially like you said, in the summer and when we go to your neck of the woods, it's God, it never gets dark. I don't know how you sleep. Well, that's why people from up north drink so much. <laughs> <laughs> Two reasons: the winter and it yeah. never gets dark in the summer. Um, it's just you know some natural melatonin. Just a little alcohol, put you to bed. Just for medicinal purposes. Yeah, that's, that's right. <laughs> so it's Call of Duty you guys play always, or is there other games? No, we play Apex. We've been that's I'm, the new yeah. Call of Duty, right? Like that's yeah, the up. It's kind of uh it's it's a little different. And I've gotten into that with Cobb. He kind of quit Call of Duty. I kept playing it some. And I kind of started to get away from, I was only playing a couple days a week and now he's sucked me into Apex. And I think we've played every night since we've been home from the Classic. Wow. Yeah, I think we might have missed one or two nights, maybe. Do you know who a huge gamer is? This will blow you away. James Overstreet. Is he really? Huge gamer. Never huge gamer. I, I started telling people he was number eight in the world. 
<laughs> people won't believe it, but he well, he isn't. But he, he shoots the crap out of his grandkids, I guess. But he loves <laughs> Call of Duty, and uh, but which is so weird to me. You know, I don't know what's weirder thinking of Street doing that. Mullins is still weirder. Mullins, yeah, to Mullins. see Mullins's game and is even weirder. Yeah, I don't. I don't really know how we sucked Mullins into it, but he. I mean, he is all about it. I didn't even know he had an Xbox. I, think. I, I think, didn't. Know. Uh, I can't remember the guy. Oh, Randy Haynes. I think yeah, he, he's a huge gamer. Like, come on. Plays, I think he plays more than Cobb. Like, I don't think he misses a day. So, how often does Cobb play? Mm, Cobb plays pretty often. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna. I, I don't. Not know. gonna bust him. No, no, I mean, out him? It's pretty oh, much. Is it more than three hours a day? Oh yeah. yeah. You didn't even you didn't even uh, pause. Cobb, Cobb's a night owl though. Like he he can do it. Like when we stay up till two, I'm like useless for the first five hours of the morning. <laughs> I don't feel like doing anything. He's up and he's ready. I'm like I just I'm not wired that way. I don't know why. I gotta I gotta get some sleep. So is it, are we over under five, five hours? Would you say? Oh, he's probably under that. Yeah, under so. that. So, so yeah. we're probably around three hours a day. Three hours. I mean, yeah. I mean, something, you know, he's good at it. He enjoys it. Yeah. That's good. Time. Do it. Yeah. What's your, what's your ultimate goal in this sport? Mm, I want to win one bad. Obviously it's been a long time. I've had quite a few top tens. I think I've had more top tens in the last three years than so I feel like I'm fishing good. So I feel like it's coming. Yeah. I'm positive. Not, I'm never overly cocky about it. Because you like I said, you never know. It's bass fishing. <laughs> it's, it's a weird sport, obviously. You're chasing well, green fish. <laughs> it's yeah. around a, a lake, like when you really think about it, but it's awesome. I mean, it's it's like any sport. I mean, if you don't get excited about it and if you don't think you're gonna win then i feel like i'm i've already lost if i get to yeah. I'm, like, oh, I'm gonna suck here that's i don't have that mindset anymore i used to some of the lakes we used to go to especially up north with your small mouth i had never done it like growing up we we didn't have small mouth <laughs> i didn't know what it was we <laughs> caught some randomly on the uh, mississippi river but that's not the same thing as yeah you know what uh what we're doing up north so but you you're good at it now no i like, love it yeah i think it's probably one of your strong suits it's, Why? Like, a it's like a vacation when i go up there because i know i'm gonna catch fish like i i mean i get excited like this year i, lo I love the schedule because we got some southern tournaments and then we got some northern tournament but we only got three um up north yeah yeah and you're also leaving I mean, it's the time of year where you don't, you want to be up North. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you guys yeah. go up there and it's, it's funny. It's, it's like the, if you look at the Canadians and everybody, like when we go to the first few events in Florida, we're all walking around with like flip flops on and, oh yeah, and we, and you have that feeling of like, wow, like everybody knows that it's come from somewhere cold. Like the second you walk out of the plane or you, you know, get that, you know, the morning you wake up, you're like, wow, this is, it's like you're reborn. The same thing happens to people from the South when they show up in Waddington, New York, yeah. and all of a sudden, wow, I can wear a hoodie again in the morning yeah. and stuff like, like that. 70 degrees, it's nice. I know I'm going to go smash some smallmouth. Like I said, it, it, half of those tournaments to me anymore, I, I mean, I'm not obviously treating it like a vacation. I'm there to do well, but it it's nice because, I, I mean, usually around here it gets super tough. You're fishing for... 10 bites a day we're up there you might catch 40 or 50 yeah and i don't i don't get to catch small mouth like we have one little mountain lake that i go to in the winter and in the spring and they're like three pounders are good ones well up yeah. there six pounders are good ones like you got to be on five pounders yeah I, I think that i've always kind of thought i think that's why so many good anglers from the south kind of get jacked on those fish for a little while because yeah. Oh, yeah. Because everyone catches, even those who aren't catching catches, you know, like you might not make the top 50, but you probably caught one of your biggest small <laughs> limits you've ever caught in your life. Um, but I think that's what happens. People go and pre-fish and they're like, yeah, I'm catching, you know, I'm, I don't know, 18, 20 pounds. Like 
I just get a few of the bigger bites and it'll be this much. And, and then they weigh in 18 pounds a day and don't even make the cut and yeah. leave their, you know, pissed, which you should be, you know, <laughs> but it, so I think that the opposite happens when you get a lot of the Northern guys, when they come South early in the season, they're there for two weeks, getting ready and everything, because yeah. if it doesn't go right for you in Florida, you might not have a limit, but right. I mean, for the most part, everybody is a limit when we're up north. It um well that yeah, that's and that's what makes tournament fishing up there so tough. Like if you're on three and a half, three and three quarter pound fish, like when we go to St. Lawrence, probably in trouble. Yeah. You better get away from those. Quit catching three and a half pounders. That's like <laughs> I mean, last year when we fished at St. Lawrence, I was on live throwing back like three eighties. Like I wouldn't even put them in the live well. I didn't want them to get shocked and have to worry about you know potentially one dying in the live well yeah and i got back home and everybody's like i can't believe you're throwing back almost four pounders i was like well i was six pounds back like <laughs> it didn't matter if i didn't catch a limit if i went from seventh to tenth that doesn't really matter yeah like, and i know i need 28 pounds to win so i'm not even gonna put them in there it's wild do yeah. you think what do you think our chances of cracking 100 are again pretty high i would say I would say at least one or two again. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like, dude? To like is that one of those deals where you're fishing the tournament and then it's like a oh yeah, I just cracked a hundred. Be you know, you you almost don't focus on it. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna be honest, Dave. You kind of uh you kind of pissed in my oatmeal when I was about to weigh in. There Why? was so I was like the eighth guy to weigh in. And uh, as soon as I got up there, all I hear is five anglers weighed in. Everybody's had over 20 pounds. And I'm just sitting back there like, oh, my God, it's going to be me. And I, broke the streak. I only had 18-something the first day. That's right. Yeah, I had a terrible first day. Just, just not knowing what decisions to make for those fish. And that's where I learned. Like, get away from the three and three-quarter pounders. I know they're – you're like, well, you start thinking, oh, man, like you said, maybe I'll run into a big one. No, most of the time they're in groups. <laughs> that pretty quick after that first day. I did not fish that place again in the tournament. I can tell you that. Well, yeah, but I was actually talking specifically like when you weighed in 100. Where, is that Fork? Is that where you got 100? Yeah, Fork was, yeah. Yeah, yeah was, that was way cooler, was, no? Yeah, that was awesome. Well, I mean, I should have had the 100 pounds of smallmouth, too, if I would have just been smart, like, on the first day. Because I had 18, and I weighed in 97 and three quarters. Like, wow. And, and I say only 18, and that's, but it was only, I was in, like, 65th or something, 67. Yeah. Wow. And then, I, but, I mean, yeah, fork was obviously, that was awesome. Because like, you're, you're starting to do the math in your head, like, when you're getting close, you know, because we weigh them, everybody knows on fork. Uh, with the slot you weigh them on the boat yeah so i'm fishing and i catch that big one and i'm like now oh, i'm close like i got an actual chance of doing this and uh i you know i figured i didn't have a chance to win with lee um but apparently through most of the day i was up around having a chance to win um and didn't realize it until i got off the water you know everybody told me but it was pretty crazy. You know, I caught like an eight and a half pounder and I'm thinking in my head, I'm like doing the math and my marshal's doing the math. <laughs> Camera guy's doing the math. He's like, man, you're at 99 something. And I was like, oh no, I got to catch one more. <laughs> I, left out, I caught like a four pounder and broke it. So, uh, That would suck to be like 99. Because yeah. not only are you thinking about winning the tournament, you're like, man, I got some a chance to do something else that I may never have another chance to do ever. Like I may never break a hundred pounds again. You don't, you don't know when that opportunity is going to come. Yeah. I mean, you look at, uh, I think it's less than 50 or 60 times or something that's happened in the history of bass. And I think last year, that's why when people start chirping about schedules and stuff, like I heard everything about our schedule last year. It's not good. It's this, it was eight century belts throughout the season. You can't like statistically, you can't say it wasn't awesome. Like, I mean, yeah. we, they, not everywhere is going to be that, but I mean, to have eight anglers do it last year, that, I mean, looking at those belts at the night of champions, I was amazed like that really, to me, that's yeah. what stands out from last season as awesome to me. That yeah. Yeah. We had a lot of that was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, 
what's the best moment in your career? Like when you probably a hundred pounds, I mean, breaking that was probably the best one so far, but I'm hoping to make some, some different ones here very shortly. Well, I mean, you've talked about Cobb a bunch and dude, before he came to the elite series, he was all Mr. Consistency, very similar to what you are. And then all of a sudden, boom, it was like his yeah. first season, he couldn't help but win. So yeah. that's what he was. I remember that. And he, I think he was like pretty close to not making the classic and with winning two events. And he's like, where did I lose the consistency? I'm like, dude, you won two tournaments. Who cares? <laughs> Like you're still going to make the classic. I would take finishing 60th and then winning two over, you know, finishing 30, 25th to 30th, like we normally do. Like, yeah, that pays the bills, but winning tournaments, that, that's what people remember. Yeah. Who, who drives you on tour? Like, is there, is there specific anglers that you're like, that's a dude who I need to beat or, and, and I don't mean in a negative way. I mean, in like, who do you look at as like, there's the benchmark and I need to chase it. I think Cobb and I do a pretty good job of keeping each other like, you know, we need to catch him. We need to, we, we keep each, because I mean, he's, he's been pretty damn good here lately. So yeah, he's, I mean, it's good to have that kind of person. And like I said, we, we share about everything. It's good to have somebody like that, but there's nobody that I'm like, man, I need to go out and beat him. Or I don't really think like that. I'm, I don't, I don't ever think about what everybody else is doing. Like, I don't get that in my head. You hear so much doc talk and all that stuff and all oh, they're catching them this way. And all the weights are going to be every time in practice, I hear from five guys, man, we're not going to catch anything. It's going to be terrible. And then you hear from five guys, everybody's going to have 30 pounds. It's like, you can't ever let that stuff get in your head. You have to block all of that, that talk out for me anyway. I, I think I that's. I don't want to go chasing waterfalls. <laughs> What's that? I don't want to go chasing waterfalls. No, don't do that. Um, it, it, I mean, that's what blows me away. How nobody can avoid it, though. It's so hard for rookies. They come and, I mean, when you came to the Elite Series, you had a lot of experience at FLW. But I'm talking about like pure rookies when they come. Like they all here. Don't follow Doc Talk. Don't do. But it's just got to be so hard. I imagine it like mentally where you're like, okay, yeah, I, I know I'm supposed to fish my own tournament, but Greg Hackney's pretty good <laughs> <laughs> and he's not doing this. He's, you know what I mean? Like, I think that's what messes with people's minds. It does. You can't, but like, let's say Greg Hackney, for instance, if he's going to go flip somewhere, throw a frog. Like I'm probably not going to beat him doing that. There's, I mean, more than likely. So I'm going to go do what, Shane LeHue is going to do like you can't can't get that stuff in your head I mean there there is like I mean I look up to a lot of the guys that we have on the yeah. elites um more so than looking at having to beat them like there's so many guys to even though you know I fish against them and I still look up to them I still think you know there there's a really a lot of really good anglers obviously it's the, it's the best group I've ever fished against by far not even close do you have any superstitions? I have zero. Zero superstitions. No, I don't have any superstitions. Wow. I mean, what about cops? He got any? Don't throw a banana in my boat or something like that. Like that. I mean, but yeah. that's just a, that's that's an old time. Like that's an obvious one. I don't yeah. Have a superstition. That's just a given. Who's the most superstitious dude on tour? Ooh. I don't really know anybody. Not not in the group that I really know. Um, Cobb's not. I mean, I, we really room with Clint Davis, Mike Huff, Skyler, Mullins at times, or Cobb and Clint Davis. Like that's, and I don't really know anybody that is in that group. Who is the most? You know the answer. I don't know. I don't know. Well, that's, I'm, I'm asking you. I mean, there's <laughs> a lot of them. I mean, all anglers tell me they're not superstitious, and then I like see things like. I'm not superstitious, but I'm like, wow, why are you always tied up on that side of the dock every day? <laughs> or why are you always one of the first ones in? Like, there's those, but I don't think those are superstitions. I think those are routines where, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I think yeah. all people who compete, I think people who work in an office go through a routine. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. they show up, they make their coffee, they did, whatever the routine is. Yeah, um, you got to get a routine so you get in the right, the right mindset. But 
No, I don't have anything weird. Like I don't keep like a lucky rock in the boat or anything like that. There's just nothing. <laughs> you know me, procrastinator. Yeah. yeah Procrastinate. I'm usually, I'm usually uh second to last to put in. Usually Uncle G beats me to that. <laughs> he, he usually rolls up about the time to start blasting off. Well, he's just wise. Like it well, I mean, there's that there's times where you th- you're like why aren't they in the water? And then I'll see like him sitting up there and he's, it's raining. <laughs> he's smart. Like, I mean, why <laughs> sit out in the rain? But I mean, I get it. He's done it. He's done it for a long time. Um, why do you think he has never won? Man, I don't know. He's another one that's super consistent though. Like he's oh, incredibly. I mean, yeah. Like he's always been that way. I just, I don't know. I'm sure he will. I'm, I'm, yeah, you know, I'm pretty sure he will. Like, he's very good. Obviously, he's been close a lot. Yeah, it's this it, is a, it's very hard to win. You have to get, you do have to get lucky. Like, there's not very many times where it's like, oh, somebody's gonna win. That's what was weird about the classic, man. Like, we were all talking like, oh, Gussie's probably gonna win. Like, he's got a shot to win again, and then he did. Like, you don't hear that ever in a tournament at our magnitude. Like, you don't, you don't hear that stuff. So I, I yeah. mean, it's just it's it's a lot of luck when you win. Like you find the right thing, or you just make it's it's the small decisions that you make throughout an event that you don't realize until after the event that that's you know why you win. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the Gussie thing's amazing. Like, not only did he win two events, but he dominated that fishery for. You can't give him the final day because he only caught two. But six days of competition, he dom like beat the field. Yeah, six days, at, which is unbelievable i mean that he i mean it's really i mean such a gussy way to win too like literally like i mean that's that's technique is from his part of the world and he was involved in the group of people while they were designing it so it's such a which but why do you think i mean i'm amazed that he didn't get pirated more than he did like is is that just a situation where being a good guy paid off like i think so yeah I think everybody has a lot of respect for Gussie. So yeah, if we go back there again, do you think guys will respect him as much? No, <laughs> or no <laughs> way. Uh, yeah, like he's won four hundred some thousand dollars off that, <laughs> that one body of water. I don't think uh, I don't think it's gonna go the same way. I mean, I know there's some guys even that practiced, and that just shows how good he is at that technique, like specifically. Yeah, and how good he is at catching smallmouth, like, and he and he grew up fishing for Lake Smallmouth. So not like the St. Lawrence River and stuff like that, but actually as far as I know. Yeah. Uh, from what lakes he fished, uh or told me he's fished where where he lives. But it's amazing to dominate when other people tried that. Like because there were still probably 15 or 20 guys I'm sure that went down there and did it. Oh yeah. And yeah. I, I was not one of them. I just that's again not something I do a ton. So I'm not going to go try to find that. Like, yeah. and, I, and I wouldn't have if I wouldn't have seen it on a Bassmaster Elite Series show. Like, I would have never looked for that. So if Gussie is Gussie's a different dude, let's say, and we're not going to insert any names, but let's say he's a more aggressive competitor on the water. I think there would have been less <laughs> respect, <laughs> I guess you would say. I don't want to be respect in that aspect because – I don't want to sound like an ass, but I mean, I'm sure there would have been a lot of guys that would have been like, you know what? Or if it's somebody that did somebody wrong. Yeah. That's probably out the window. Yeah. And there's very, very few on the elite series. I mean, very, very few that don't respect like, and I, I mean, really, I can't think of any that don't have the respect for other anglers. Like we pretty much all do. Like when we go, even when we go to like Tennessee river lakes, where you know you're going to be piled up on a ledge or Florida. Like most people get along. Like, you yeah, but I'm sure you can think of a few. I don't want you to say them, but I feel like you're lying to me right now. Shay. I there feel might like be, might be a couple, maybe. I, the, the translation from I can't think of any in my head. I heard I can't say any on yeah, a podcast. Yeah, change, change the word to <laughs> can't say any, and I wouldn't. I would never do that. No, no, it's. Uh, but I also. I get that. You know what I mean? I'm not saying like, it might not be the way you play, but I also like, I think it's, 
it shocks me when people are like, can you believe so-and-so pulled it? Like, dude, people will rob a 7-Eleven for $500. So if you don't think that people, I mean, in every competition, doesn't matter whether it's, you name the, the sport, you know, there's always somebody who's trying to push the edge. But the weird thing in fishing is it's not celebrated like it is in other sports. Like in fishing, yeah. it's a negative. But in other sports, I mean, people get celebrated for being that guy right yeah that's i mean i guess it's just the fishing so old school and from where it came from i guess it's just that respect aspect and i've always held that i hope i mean heck somebody could say maybe i'm the bad guy but i wouldn't know it <laughs> i don't think so i don't I no don't i don't think you are but i've told you i mean you can switch from the baby shark to the great white and he like yeah. that's your wrestling heel turn. Like <laughs> at one turn, we just be like, "I ate the baby shark. <laughs> the great white's here to dominate." <laughs> yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna flip that switch someday. I can't wait. I can't wait. What do you think a victory? One of your victories looks like. I mean, right now I'm as calm as you always are. I'm 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 a little concerned. It might just be. It no. I mean, uh, I'm man. I'll I'll probably cry. To be honest. Maybe not like full blown. But the the issue is going to be uh, seeing the family. Ah. That's, really, that's going to be the hard part. Ah. And I hope we get to that. So I'll be just fine. I'll I'll cry like a grown man on stage in front of however many people are watching, and not think twice about it. It's funny. Nobody ever makes fun of anyone for crying up there, though. No. You know what I mean? Like if you yeah. if we cry in front of that group of people for anything else, like if you stub your toe and you start crying. They will make fun of you for the rest of your life. Right. But nobody ever makes fun of it. Be I think because everyone gets it. You know what I mean? Like you guys have all hostage so much of your life and risked so much to make yeah. it there and to finally of, achieve that moment. Yeah. I mean, it's a lot of pent up emotion. Of, you know, I mean, there's there's a whole side of this. Like a lot of people have, you know, am I going to make it thoughts? And then you win one. Then there's a lot of emotion that goes into this. Yeah, I'm I'm even killed on the outside. Let's put it that way. Okay. Well, just so you know, I'm going to kick you if you don't if you don't celebrate and you don't like cry or do something. Yeah. I will kick you. I mean, but it'd be for you. It's just for you. It'll so be you a have celebration that. after the tournament. That I can promise you. Really? Oh yeah. All right. What 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 kind of setup are we going to have for this celebration? What do you think? Like, I don't know. Probably be a pretty big party at the house. All right. All right. Will I be invited? Absolutely. See why not. That's what everyone says. Then they win, and I'm like, I'll, I'll "Hey, <laughs> I'll buy you. If I win one, I'll buy you the plane ticket. You heard it here. You come on. Deal, deal. All right. Well, I want you to win one now. I want you I'll to win. Some adult transfusions waiting on you. <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. No, um, dude. I think it's coming, and I think I think you know you're incredibly mellow and that that that's what it, i mean if you were more of a i think that's what makes it harder on the higher strong people as it gets further away it's like you want it so bad but i think i mean you're chill enough to let it happen i believe yeah that's gonna whenever it does happen it's that's when it's gonna i mean it's just it is what it is uh, that's just i mean it's the way it works in fishing like you know there's plenty of those top tens where I had a chance and it just didn't work out on one of the days of the tournament. Yeah. That's, you know, if I make just one different decision and several of those, it goes a little different, but there's also guys that finish, you know, 20th and they're, they can say the same thing. So it's just the way fishing is. It's volatile. It if is. you could change anything about the sport of fishing, what would it be? Rule change, whatever. Rule change. Well, I mean, I think fishing is in a pretty good place, honestly. I think we've made a lot of changes that have been for the better for fishing. Like, it's on the map more than it's ever been. Um, I mean, there's nothing off the top of my head that I would just make a change right now. Like I think, like I said, it's it's in a pretty good spot. I, I think that's a great answer, dude. And I, and I think it it sometimes at times it frustrates me that we don't get that answer more. Because yeah. I think, but I also am asking a question where most people are led towards 
something they don't like, but I feel like it. Sometimes people need to look at our sport. Everybody talks about grow the sport, grow the sport, and that's that's cool and all. But yeah. I mean, at some point, you got to look and be like, "Wow, it is ridiculous that 160 plus thousand people show up to Knoxville to watch the yeah. Bassmaster Classic. It is ridiculous. I mean, it, our regular Elite Series weigh-ins. When you look at the sea of people that are out there, it's ridiculous. Like literally, all you guys do is hold a fish. <laughs> it's exactly. pretty freaking good. Yeah. Oh, the expo was. I mean, it was insane. Uh, the amount of people walking around, the p- amount of people that waited to get on a bus to go walk away. Dude, the, the, the line had to be a mile long. Wow. I mean, this is insane. You were all just going to watch people hold up fish, like you said. That's awesome. Like, I mean, that's the only reason we continue to do what we, we are doing right now. Like, without that, fishing is not a professional sport. It's a hobby. You're going to be yeah. in some little jackpot tournaments, and that's it. I wish we yeah. did a little longer into the season sometimes. That is the only thing that I would. I agree with that. I wish yeah. they were spread out. Like, let's have one a month every month for the however yeah. many. If it's eight months, cool. We'll have one a month for the first eight months. Not however many events. If it's nine events, first nine months. Because you're going to see people tested in so many different ways. And I think the the winner gets their moment more. You know what I mean? When we do back-to-backs Over, like we right. do so often – if you're on the wrong side of that back to back, you don't get that moment as much, you know, you don't get celebrated yeah. by the industry as much. No, not, yeah, not for as long. Cause I mean, you know, right. Like I said, the next week, there's probably going to be somebody else that wins, I guess not going to win twice more than likely. So that happens yeah. very, very few times. I, I got one last question for you. What is the best advice you've ever been given in your life? Oh my gosh. That is incredibly hard. I know. Uh, I'm gonna go with uh, my dad's favorite one. I think before you speak, <laughs> that was his favorite line, Jimmy. And there was probably a reason for that. So I don't remember the exact moment of when that reasoning came out, but it was probably not at a good time or something that I had done. Uh, you know, there was there was times where I was a wild card growing up. Yeah, so, but not. I- that's shockingly similar to my dad's advice to me. He used to say, make sure your brain is in gear before you put your mouth in drive. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, it's the same thing. And sometimes um, I still don't adhere to that advice, but. I it. think you do. Come that's on. you're. I do. My dumb ass says stupid stuff all the time, <laughs> but I think you're pretty. You, you're a thinker before stuff comes out of your mouth. When's the last time you said something was like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, yeah. I can't really think of one offhand. <laughs> um, well, I've enjoyed this conversation. Me too. We'll have to do it again. Does we'll grandma have... think the Chiefs are gonna win again? Yeah, I think they're making some good moves. They are. I mean, really then are. being in the Carolinas, I gotta look pull for the Panthers, obviously, some to some extent. No, they're making don't. a lot of good moves. So if I go to some of the games, it's like the only, you know. It's hard to travel to a Chiefs game. I hear you. How did how did the Chiefs thing start with Grandma? How did she become it? Like, was she originally from that part of the world, or? Uh, we were. I was born in Iowa, Davenport. Um, okay. So that was like the closest football team. Um, it was either that or like the Bears, or you know. So she just kind of picked the Chiefs. Then they they actually moved to Kansas City. Um, yeah. Grandfather used to work for Hendrick Motorsports. So really? They, yeah, they used to go to. Just about every Chiefs game. Wow. Wow. Arrowhead's the most badass NFL stadium in the world. It is. It really right. is. Um, have you ever seen the owner's suite there? I have not. You need to not Google it. Owner. You need to Google know. it. It dude, it's a house. It's... I've got lucky enough uh to get uh to get to watch a game there myself and Sarah, my wife. Mike McKinnis and his wife, he's a huge Chiefs fan. They're huge Chiefs fans, too. So we got hooked up by Katie Scallon of Golf State's Toyota. He used to run TTBC to go to. But they're, the owner's suite is literally a house. Like, you go in, and you're like, like you expect it to be chairs and, you know, TVs. And, I mean, it's the owner's suite. It's pretty splanked out, right? No, like, there is, like, a freaking 12-foot wide staircase that goes up. Like, you think you're in... A mansion somewhere because I guess like the owners, the hunts live in Dallas. 
So they travel to games. So like growing up, their kids, they wanted their kids to have like a home environment <laughs> while they were at games. So like, it's so weird. You're there and you're, I mean, it's incredible. I mean, it's way, I should have rules when I go places. Like, I think I did have rules, but I broke all the rules. Like that, well, you're there's too to. much free food and alcohol for a guy like me to go there. But you're, you're hanging out and you're like, if you turn one direction, you forget you're even at a football game. But then you just see like family members like go up the stairs to their bedroom and stuff. And you're just like, how is this even a thing? Is it that uh, I, my next life, I want to own an NFL team. They seem to have some pretty yeah. good lives. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, I need to win the lottery before that happens. Yeah, a lot that's, of lotteries. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like that's a little out of my, my realm of possibilities with a bank account. <laughs> Well, I was happy just to go there for one Yeah, night. that's pretty awesome. That's an yeah. experience. It was an incredible experience. We got to share it with um, Eric Stone Street was there, the guy from Modern Family. He was there. Really? Yeah, he may or may not have told me I was drunk. <laughs> well, and I may or well, may well, not have been. He should have said, well, yeah, what else am I supposed to do? <laughs> You're supposed to do to watch football, aren't you? Gosh, listen, dude, I swear to you, I've never told this story in the public ever before. <laughs> Oh, boy. oh. <laughs> so we're we're I mean it's the Chiefs and at that time this is pre Mahomes this is um Alex Smith was our QB but it wasn't the last few years with him it was we were still really struggling um so there was a lot of festive things going on just to, uh, <laughs> this game's not really that exciting um yeah so I'll be honest I I way overindulged that day. Like I didn't puke over anyone or anything like oh, that, but I mean, I'm a gentleman, but I had too much to drink in, in any circle, never mind that circle. So I wake up the next morning and I remember we went to like the store on the way out, like the store, where they sell the programs and sell all sorts of stuff, chief store. So I wake up and I'm like, we're packing because we got to leave. And I open this Chiefs bag and I start pulling out like these hats and things like that. And I pull out like the ugliest Chiefs jacket ever. Like it is, it is just like, it's so ugly. Like I've never worn it anywhere other than to bur burn wood. <laughs> That's what I, it's, it's just the ugliest Chiefs jacket ever. And, and I turned to Sarah and I'm like, why in the world did you buy this? And she's like, I tried to talk to you out of it for 20 minutes. And you said it was a must purchase. So um, don't drink too much or you might, <laughs> might buy an ugly jacket at a Chiefs game. That's is it like just straight yellow? Like the Chiefs no, game? it's like gray and yellow and red. It's just yeah. a lot going on. Yeah, it's a lot going on. It's just <laughs> like it's it's a lot. I mean, it's it uh somebody probably really liked it, but uh, I didn't, but I bought it. Um and well, evidently I mean, needed to have it. Inner Dave really liked it, you know. <laughs> I loved it. I was must purchase. What is that drunk word or sober thoughts? I think you're just maybe having some sober thoughts. Maybe you really did like it. No, no, because <laughs> dude, I, like when I looked, when I pulled it out of the bag, I was like, it took Sarah 10 minutes to convince me that I really bought it. I'm like, you're full of shit. I <laughs> would no never do home. that. I would yeah. never buy this. There's no amount of alcohol on earth that would make me buy this jacket. <laughs> Evidently, there I had the exact the right amount. <laughs> Frank the Tank bought it. Not <laughs> all right. Well, I look forward to hanging out with you all season long. Thanks for doing this, dude. Yeah, I appreciate it, Dave. Thank you, man. So there you go. That proves that that not not all sharks are aggressive. Sometimes they can be quite docile. But I will tell you, when it comes to attacking, the baby shark is uh, one to watch. And uh, speaking of attacking. This podcast, obviously, um, for those of you who keep up with the Bassmaster schedule, we're not here right now. This was actually previously recorded. We're in Alabama getting ready to kick off the fifth stop of the Bassmaster Elite Series on Lay Lake tomorrow morning. So if you are in the area, come on by. Love to meet you. Love meeting humpers and people that watch the show and uh, say hello and uh, say hello to the baby shark and... and and Jake, if you see him there, there's all sorts of people that you guys should be feeling like you're friends with because of this show. And just go up and tell them, I'm a humper, and I loved seeing you on that show. So hopefully they'll come on the show again in the future. Remember, the question of the week, let me know what you're doing when you're listening to this. Have a great week. Enjoy being 
and we'll see you next time. Take it away, Bob Cop. Thanks for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Because Bob Cobb of the Bassmasters told you to. You hear?